everyone. I know there's um, a five dollar fee, and we can just collect that as you um, as you want. And I think that you, um, you can just give that to me. It doesn't need to go through the library process, so um, that would be great. Um, so I am here tonight to talk about roots because we're talking about rooted in Vermont, and I'm here to talk about what might be growing in your backyard that you may or may not know about. Um, but the reason that um, it's fall and the reason that we look for roots in the fall is because the plants, when they die back, all the medicinal properties go into the roots. And so there's many roots that we can look for this time of year um, if you know where they are. So for instance, if you're looking for dandelion roots and you haven't dug, dug any in the spring, you need to know where those dandelion plants are so that in the fall you can go back and get them. Or um, something like echinacea, you might have it growing in your um, perennial bed, in your, in your landscape bed, and not even know that you have echinacea sitting right in your perennial bed because purple coneflower is echinacea, which is a very commonly used um, cold remedy for, for one. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the roots that you can find around you and how you might use them and um, how some of the, the ways that you would incorporate those into your lifestyle or your ways of getting them into your system. So the tea that you have right now that's roasted dandelion with vanilla um, is um, dandelion root, and, which is really good for your kidneys. And so um, you may not have a kidney problem, or as people get older, their liver, your liver and your kidneys kind of get a little stopped up sometimes and, um, or don't work so well. Your kidneys are also very much um, associated with your blood pressure. So if you have a blood pressure problem that seems that's looking like it, your numbers are getting worse, you might want to start having a little dandelion tea on a daily basis, and you'd be surprised how that might be all you need to adjust that in your system, or what you're actually doing is you're feeding your kidneys so they can work efficiently, so that your kidneys can do what they're supposed to do. And so the reason that, whether it's um, leaf material, whatever plant you have to use, or if, whether it's a root, whatever it is, the reason that plants make good medicine is really because they're good food. And so I'm also a nutritional counselor, um, so I have a lot of knowledge about just food and nutrition also. And so um, it dovetails, herbs dovetail very nicely with nutrition because it's all about food for your body. That's how your body recognizes it rather than a pharmaceutical where um, it's a chemically processed um, ingredient that goes into your system and thus often creates side effects that we don't necessarily see when we use herbs. Now that said, you have to keep in mind that everybody is unique and everybody's different. So at any time, anybody could have some kind of a reaction or an intolerance to any herb, whether it would be a common one that most people are not. So when you're using herbs, it's really um, a good thing for you to um, take a, a smaller dose when you first start and then just make sure that you're, you're not um, reacting in any way or it's not giving you an upset stomach or um, any symptoms, but a negative symptoms in that regard. Because there are some things, for instance, people that have, um, are allergic to, um, uh, poison ivy can also have trouble with chamomile. It's a similar type of species. And sometimes not, but you know, there are herbs like that that are from similar in species. So um, anyways, just it's always good to be wise and do things in moderation when you first begin. Um, and the smaller the dose that works for you, the better. Um, so anyway, those are just a, a few background pieces of information when you're using herbs, but um, so where do you find these roots? So sometimes you find them in your vegetable garden. 
So things like garlic and onions. So um, you know, it's hard to um, classify whether they're actually food or medicine because we use them both ways. Um, um, gobo, for instance, is actually burdock, a, a cultivated form of burdock that you can grow in your garden. Um, burdock root is really good for you. It's a, again, it's, it's a, a bitter herb. It's one of the bitters. Um, all the bitters are really good for your liver. So you, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. Um, but gobo is um, cultivated, um, long, long tap root, and some people will use it like um, a re regular raw vegetables in their salads, for instance. But it's a bitter, so um, in the Western culture, we don't often, we are more attracted to sweet and salty things, and the bitter and the sour things um, are kind of set to the side, but every one of those tastes sensations on your tongue actually stimulates um, your certain organs in your system to work. And bitters actually stimulate your liver, which is part of your digestive system, to begin to make the bile and the um, other materials that your digestive tract is actually going to use to break down your food. Thus, the old... Um, the gentlemen in their smoking jackets in the um, in the smoking room in the hotel in the old tradition, having their bitters before dinner, that was why they were doing that. Um, it was a social uh, event for in the tr that old tradition, but those bitters had a purpose, and we have bitter recipes now that we can actually make, and I have one here that. Um, we make that's made with yellow dock, which is another bitter herb um, that um, also has some other roots in it, um, like ginger and turmeric, which are herb roots that grow in your vegetable garden most commonly if you were going to grow them. Um, but we usually get them at the grocery store. But still, they're roots and they have extremely. Um, high levels of immune boosting capacity. And um, the reason that roots especially are good food and good medicine is because they grow in the earth. And if, if you have good soil and, you've, and it's been taken care of well, um, and it hasn't been you know overgrown and overtaxed and, and fertilized and all those things we know that have negative effects on the soil, if you have good soil, it's full of great mineral content. And minerals we, all, we need in very small amounts, but because minerals are generally rocks, it's like we don't digest rocks very well, but if the plant takes them up and then you eat the plant, then you're getting good mineral material um, into your system that helps. And they're often the catalysts for many um, Chemi electrochemical processes that your body carries out. So that's one of the reasons why bitters are good. So um, we have bitters, we have tea, and we have tinctures, which are made, um, we're gonna talk about making simple tinctures tonight. Um, you can, you know, you can go to the health food store and buy standard extracts, which are also tinctures, but they're very carefully measured with the intent that the outcome would be that every single bottle of an extract would have the same um, um, strength and consistency as the next bottle. So if you're making tinctures in your home though, and you're making what we call simples, it's very, um, it's, if you're using simples with herbs that are non-toxic and very, um, very easily um, adaptable to your lifestyle. Um, you don't have to worry about the exact amounts like you do with herbs that are really potent. So if you're growing herbs in your backyard um, or using things that you're wild crafting that are around you, um, you can make simple tinctures um, according to what your family might need. So if you have family members that are have bronchitis regularly or, or um, 
um, respiratory issues, or if you have family members that have digestive issues, you might be, you might have collect those herbs that are around you that actually um, pertain to those particular problems and have them on your shelf. And you can make your own simple medicine that could be a first, um, first, your first response to a problem in your household without having to run to the pharmacy. Um, and it takes a little bit of knowledge, but um, making them actually is quite simple and not, and not extremely complicated. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Kathy, yeah. can you ever chew on roots? You can chew on roots if you don't mind. So for instance, um, we have lots of bitter leaf, lettuce, escarole, those kinds of things, radicchio, that we use in our salads often. And there are different, they, those, have, those have bitter um, potential to them. Um, and not everything is sweet. And so again, bitter is great because it stimulates your liver to, to work efficiently. Your liver does ex an extreme amount of work in your system. It has to um, filter out all the toxins out of your body. So anything that comes in externally that has any kind of toxic substances in them is gonna get filtered through your liver and, on, and then filtered through your kidneys because your kidneys filter out the liquids and your kidneys filter out more of the solids. But um, but your liver balances insulin, balances cholesterol, um, does a lot of hormonal work, um, cleans out toxins. So it, it needs to work efficiently. And so the best way without taking medicine to, uh, to get your liver to work efficiently is to continually use bitter foods and herbs and that because you're actually helping your liver to work efficiently um, so that's one of the reasons why um, something like a bitter might be a tonic herb considered a tonic herb or something like milk thistle which is a liver related herb might be considered a tonic herb because you're taking it regularly to sustain that system and that organ so that it can do the work that it's supposed to do. So really what you're doing is you're feeding yourself the things that your body really needs um, and keeping it clean of toxins. Because these days, I, figure, I forget how many thousands of toxins a day that we are actually exposed to. So they're in the air and they're in the water and unfortunately they're in our food. Um, and they might be in your med they might be in your cleaning closet. Um, they could come from any number of places. So um, we like to be intentional about detoxing and keeping our bodies cleaned up and eating like really clean food. Um, so where else do you find these things? So you might have an herb garden in your backyard, and you might um, you know look at a book like this that's about the medicinal garden and um, you know, figure out what you'd like to grow in your garden and, and you cultivate those um, close to the house. Um, and then there's the fringes of the field in the forest where there's foraging to be done and there's a lot of things that most people consider to be weeds that are actually really good for you. So all those people who put chemicals all over their lawn and destroy their dandelions mm -hmm. every year, not only are they putting a very toxic substance on their lawn that they're gonna breathe every day and add to your own <coughs> bodily toxicity, but they're killing the good stuff that's actually there. And so a lot of us, if we let our, our lawns grow, we find that we have actually quite a number of things that grow in your lawn. Um, but the thing that's probably the most common one that's the root um, herb would be dandelions and there's lots of ways to use dandelions so we're drinking a tea um, you can tincture it um, you can and this tea by the way and so we've used vanilla or may I say the Republic of Tea has used vanilla and there's no sugar in here 
but it does taste rather sweet. They've, they've um, um, balanced off the bitterness so that you can actually enjoy a nice cup of tea. Um, if you took it straight in a tincture form, it might be quite a lot more bitter. Um, or, you know, you can encapsulate it, you can use it um, dandelion wine. There are a lot of wines that um, can be added to herbals or herbal substances added to them. And that's another way of getting um, herbs into your system that might be not as tasteful as you'd like um, without, and so that they taste a little bit better. Um, so though there's lots of things that grow around the edges of your fields and your forests. So marshmallow is a really interesting um, plant that has a beautiful pink flower on it. Um, and you may see it in the fields and it has these beautiful pink flowers. It probably goes about two to three feet high. Um, and if you went to dig that root up, it has a very long tap root, and most of the time when you dig it, you can't get the whole root. And so it'll break off, and you'll take what you get, and next year you'll find that it's growing back again, because they're pretty tenacious. Um, there's another interesting plant um, called Joe Pie Weed that has oh, become geez. really popular as a landscape plant nowadays. Um, it's that grows about four to six feet high and um, has these beautiful pink flowers that um, grow late in the, in the summer, early fall. And at this point, up where we are, they've, um, we've had hard frost, so they're gone at this point. But they do grow around the edges of wet areas. Um, so if you have a wet area in your yard, it might be a good thing for you to plant. This is used, the root of this plant is used for urinary tract issues and, and kidney stones. So people who are prone to kidney stones might use a tincture of this in order to um, keep that at bay. That's a question. You mentioned marshmallow, but you didn't say what it was good for. Yeah, marshmallow is, um, is is what we call mucilaginous. So what that means is it has this kind of slimy, smooth kind of um, gel that it exudes if it's tinctured or put into a water base of some sort. Um, and what that does is it can be used in formulas for like your digestive tract if it's irritated, so it will soothe it, or for your respiratory system if you have like um, you know, a, some kind of chest lung congestion to like soothe those. So it's usually put into formula with something else, like in a respiratory scenario, it might be used with mullen that's a mild expectorant or elecompan, which is an expectorant um, to keep the coughing um, irritation less um, aggravating. Um, bone set is very similar, looks very similar to Joe Pie Weed and grows in wet places too, but it has the little flower crown is white. And bone set, the, the, the roots of bone set are used to um, help heal skin and bone and um, um, open wounds and that kind of thing. Um, bone set was used um, traditionally uh, as it would, you would make a poultice out of it and you would, if someone had a broken leg, they would wrap the leg with this poultice of bone set and it actually creates um, bone quicker and it would help that bone break to heal. So um, it does the same thing with, um, you know, wounds and that kind of thing. So that would be what they would use that for. Um, what else? Elecom pan is um, an interesting flower and that you see growing late summer. And I don't know where did it go? Um, it looks like daisies when you look at it from a distance, and it grows in the fields. 
and <clears throat> it is really good. It has inulin in it, which is really good for your lungs. So it's a mild expectorant, and I can't find it. It's not an L. There it is. You see big patches of them growing in the fields, and you, they come up pretty easily. They look like small daisies. Um, they're very beautiful, and but they're very good for your lungs. The, that's what the root is used for. Is that the Latin name? Inulin? The Alicampan? Yeah. No, nope. Alicampan is, it's been known that way. Um, it, the Latin name is um, inulin. Yeah. Um, what else? So burdock, we're all familiar with burdock, right? Um, that grows everywhere. And um, the thing about burdock is the same thing, the roots of wild burdock are like really tough to get out. Once it takes root in your yard, it's like you have a war on your hands. <laughs> Um, but the thing about burdock is, too, that um, the big seed heads that form, that stick to us wherever we go, those, um, if you think about what a seed is, it's actually the essence of the entire plant. So you can actually tincture that seed head, too, without digging up all those roots and have um, medicine that way. And the same thing goes for echinacea. So purple cone flower is echinacea. Now we use the root of the plant um, and you can use the leaf and stuff during the summertime but the, the greatest medicine is in the root when it dies back this time of the year. Um, but those seed pot, those seed heads um, are quite large and when the flowers die back and those their seeds form you can do the same thing with those seed pods and quite often I'll take a couple seed pods and just throw them into my tincture bottle with the roots and let them tincture all at the same time. Um, yellow dock is an interesting plant. It has, it's sometimes known as curly dock because the edges of the leaves um, have little scallops on them. They're kind of a little bit curly. They look similar to burdock in some ways, but you can tell the difference between the, them because the, the um, leaves curl. But the root, if you dug the roots, burdock is quite white very white when the root, you come bring the root up. When you bring the root up from yellow dock, it is yellow. As a matter of fact, if you were making um, dyeing yarn or cloth or something like that, you could use yellow dock to make a nice yellow, light, tan color um, dye. <clears throat> okay, so I'm not gonna be able to find that one either. You said curly dock and yellow dock are the same? Curly dock and yellow dock, that's the same, same animal, same plant. <laughs> and it can't, it doesn't get a flower per se, so it's mostly the leaves that you recognize them from. And that's another thing that with root plants, it's like if you're looking for root plants that are growing in the field in the forest, then you're looking, you need to remember where they are. So when you find them in the summer and you can identify them, you want to remember where they are so that when they die back in the fall, you go and get the right thing. Um, it's always good to try to identify your plants in one or two different ways um, rather than just one because there are some false guys out there that can fool you. Um, the most false guys are always next to the real guys. <laughs> <laughs> Not always. <laughs> do you have any techniques as far as do you just put stakes in the ground during the year? When you, you can do that. Um, uh, you know, usually there's enough plant material still above ground that you can, um, if you know where they are, you can find them again. Yeah. But if you're not familiar with them, that would be a good way for you to start learning. Um, you also say yeah. that. Um, Earlier, you hit your first frost, therefore the foliage has died down. You can still go back and uh, pull the roots up, it's below the 
That's the time. It's always good to wait till the plants are killed off by the fr killing frost, because then all that plant material goes, all that plant strength goes back. That's when it goes back to the roots. Kathy, this isn't necessarily about roots, uh, and then a lady who picked up and I'm fucking eat a, a bunch, but as far as planting bulbs, is it after the killing frost that you plant the bulbs, or can you plant them anytime in fall? I think, I think bulbs, bulbs you can plant like September, you know, yeah. later in the year. But is it okay after the killing frost as well? Yeah, because yeah. they're, they're under cover. Right. Most things underground will stay around 50 degrees. Um, except in really cold climates or where there isn't a lot of snow on the ground. Um, and then the temperature of the ground might get down to colder temperatures, which is why some plants don't grow in our colder climates. My question was, if you're wild crafting or even if you're, like we have echinacea for a landscape plant, how much can you take without killing? So when you pull the root, you kill the plant. So what I always do is um, when you're har oh well, so here's, here's a kind of a rule of thumb for harvesting plants in the wild especially, because you always want to make sure that you don't take all of it. You want to leave some of it so that it continues to grow. So when I work in my own flower gardens, I will pull, I, I have enough flower in the garden so that I don't have to take all of it. And I will take maybe a third of it at the most and leave two thirds of it. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll take those seed heads and break them up and seed them into the place where I just pulled the, um, the boom plant out and so that they will grow back. And so it'll take two years for them to get to be their full maturity. And so in the meantime, I can go back and take another third of my plant space and I've still got mature plants for the next year. So, and it, the same goes for when you're working with, um, when you're wild crafting things. So you wanna do things like stay away from um, roadways, like within 20 feet of a road because you don't want petroleum and, and um, salt and those kinds of things contaminating your plant materials. You want to be away from main roads or away from some kind of toxic, um, uh, you know, building or something like that. And again, you want to take only a third of what you find. If you're going to take, a, if you need to take a lot, you only want to take like a third of what's there. That leaves another third for somebody else to come along and get, and a third to keep growing. And whenever you get a chance to put seed back into the ground, it's a really great thing to do. Um, echinacea is one of the plants that has been over harvested in, the, in past years. Now that people grow it in their, in their landscape beds, it's, it's better, but um, people who are you know, making large quantities of product, it's like echinacea, we had to actually start as herbalists starting to cultivate echinacea in, a, in a, um, a formal setting in order to have enough product to, you know, serve the world as it were. So um, we have to be careful of things like that too. So there's a number of plants that get over harvested. Um, golden seal is one of them, very potent antibacterial antibiotic plant, but um, it's been over harvested and so it's if you go to buy it in the um, in like the apothecary, it can be rather costly, and that's why, because it's over harvested and it has to be cultivated now. And that plant particularly grows in a woodland setting <clears throat> under hardwood, and so in order to grow that in a cultivated um, scenario, they have to recreate that kind of setting. So it gets a little labor intensive. Um, Kathy, is uh, golden seal, that's not the same as golden rod, is it? No. Okay. So golden seal is a root. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so golden rod, now I'm going to, just because you brought that up, I'm going to show you something. Golden rod grows, you know, like in um, August uh, during the season when people have um, allergy symptoms and everybody thinks they're allergic to it. And they're not. 
because what you're really allergic to is ragweed. But ragweed is a little brown vine that you don't hardly ever see, but it grows at the same time as rag as golden seal. And but golden seal is actually an antidote for allergy symptoms. Goldenrod. That's golden rod. This is golden rod. Okay. Okay, and it's the upper, it's the aerial portion. So it's the leaves and the flowers that you use in this case. Um, but so golden seal is actually a woodland plant that we harvest the roots from. And then there's a little, um, there's a little plant that's called gold thread yep. that grows in um, places where um, it mossy places in higher elevation. We find it when we hike a lot. Um, but it's in wet places. It could be near like swampy areas where there might be mossy areas that are growing, and it kind of looks like a little, um, um, an, a little Irish shamrock. It has a very unique um, three little um, leaves on it. And if you reach down through the moss and you grab a hold of the root, it's tiny, tiny, tiny. It's called. It looks like a thread. It's that tiny. And it's those little pieces of thread that you actually tincture. The little, and those are the roots. <coughs> and again, that's another scenario where you want to be careful that you don't take too much. But those little gold threads will turn your tincture bright yellow, just like golden, just like um, um, golden, seal. golden seal will. Um, and it has the same. It's a similar species. So it has the same properties. So you can, if living in Vermont, we have, we're in a climate where we can find gold thread very easily, and you can use that as a substitute for golden seal. It's, it's antibiotic and it's antiviral. It's a very strong um, medicinal herb, and it's great for um, any kind of situations that require <coughs> might require antiseptic or <coughs> antibiotic use. Um, as a substitute for antibiotics. So um, problems with issues in the digestive tract where people might have ulcers or they might have um, really inflamed um, Crohn's disease or something of that nature where there's, there's actually a, um, a, a chance that there could be infection. Um, golden seal or gold thread as a substitute would work very nicely. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question mm -hmm. about, we, we misidentified, I think, agrimony and golden rod. They're separate. Are they yes, the okay. they're different. So the golden rod is more, we've seen, I think we've seen that along the roadside. It's very showy and taller. Yeah, than when it comes, it comes like in massive amounts. It's all in the back. It's everywhere. Yes, and agrimony. I don't know. If, I don't think I have a picture of agrimony. So, but they're different when you look at them. Um, that's agrimony. Oh. So it has a stalk to it. Yeah, and the others are. Kind and the of other, shirt. yeah, they have like the whole head is like yellow. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So they kind of have a stalk like mullet. Similar to mullen, but it's more of a, the mullen stalk is quite tall. I don't think agrimony gets that tall, but it has a very unique flower arrangement. Whereas mullen, the mullen flower is more like this. Um, I have a picture of mullen too. <clears throat> Um, anyways, Mullen has that silvery, feathered kind of leaf on it that's thick, like succulents are, and then the stalk. Can't find it. Um, and then there's um, um, uh, there's just because we have issues with ticks now in Vermont. Um, we have a school that um, runs from May to October, 
and one of my students, we actually um, created these tick kits that next year will actually be um, selling. Um, but it's made with an herb called Andrographis. Andrographis is an herb that grows in India, Jerome. And it is um, a repellent for ticks. It works really well. Um, you can buy it in the health food store. You can add it to water and make um, spritz it on your skin. It's non-toxic. You can use it on animals. They can lick it, and it doesn't make them sick. Um, and um, ticks do not like it. If you do happen to get bitten um, by a tick and you pull the tick by the tick out, you can actually take um, some antigravis internally. Um, and it'll help to keep it out of your bloodstream. It's an extremely bitter herb, so you want to chase it with water or something. Um, and then in some, one of our tickets that has, we also put a bottle of Colossus liniment, which is an antiseptic that you can actually put on <coughs> this site. <coughs> Excuse me, but unfortunately, we have not yet learned how to grow Andrographis in the States because the climate isn't quite right, so um, we have to get it um, from outside the states and we have to be careful because um, as Jerome and I were talking about earlier, it's like when things come in from outside the states, they're often sprayed or radiated unless they're processed before they get here, unless they're bottled and processed before they come in. So. Um, it, I, I guarantee, though, that that herb will probably become, um, you know, culturated to the states sooner. Um, and then there's things like um, angelica, which is an herb that um, has been used for female problems, and the root has been used. It tastes like anise, so it's been candied and used for years and years and years, and used in wine and. Um, it can get to be like six feet tall. It's got very showy leaf on it, and um, um, that's an interesting one to have in your herb garden if you use if you have if there's female issues that you need to deal with. only shows the seed, the head, um, but you can see that the leaf itself um, looks, the big leaves actually look like big maple leaves, but the plants themselves will grow this high and they get quite large, so you have to make sure that you make space for them in your garden. Are they related to parsnips? <laughs> to parsnips? No. Okay. Different species. Similar. It does look similar, but the plant itself grows totally different. Okay. Yeah, and it smells like anise when you get okay. close to it. And they form heads, um, seed heads on them, like dill does, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. those seeds can be used too. And those would grow wild, or you can only cultivate. Those you garden? usually are usually you have to buy a cultivated plant, and it ends up in your garden somewhere, and or you put it somewhere where it's not quite so invasive. So, yeah. Um, so anyway, there's lots of plants like that and many to be found and um, it, you know, you, want, you need to learn each one as you become, the more you use it or, and, and a lot of times if you move it into your living environment, you can watch it grow. So you watch it from the spring and how it develops over the summer and what it looks like and then when it dies back. And so you get to recognize plants where you, when you go to other places and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I have one of those in my garden. It's like, and you begin to recognize them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna hand, um, you can just take one of these. Um, this is a really basic um, description of how to make a tincture. <clears throat> so you can tincture most, all of these roots you can tincture. If you were gonna make a tea from a raw, from raw material, you would wanna put it in a pot and simmer it for 
three or four minutes on your stove in order to drink it. So rather than just steeping it like you would um, leaf material, um, because it's a root in root form, that you'd want to simmer it for a few minutes. In this case here, it's already been roasted. What you're drinking has already been roasted. So um, it's already been um, heated and cooked. But if you were going to just have you know, dandelion root tea that you picked out of your garden, you'd want to chop it up into smaller pieces and either dry it that way and use it later or just simmer it a few um, minutes on your stove and then drink it and strain it and drink it um, rather than steeping it because it needs a little more time. But a simple tincture that's made um, with alcohol, so alcohol is the common thing that is used to um, um, put your herbs into that draws the medicine out of the roots. It's not the only thing that can be used. Um, sometimes people would use um, brandy perhaps because it has a flavor to it. And so if you were tincturing a root like valerian, which is a sedative, but literally tastes and smells like dirty socks, <laughs> you might want to disguise that flavor. It's an incredible sedative. Or, um, you know, if you've got somebody that's in a high anxiety situation, or if you have um, some kind of trauma going on, or, um, you know, um, it could act like, a, you know, a, a painkiller even. Um, as a sedative to help just bring that pain level down. Um, it's like you could take up to an ounce if someone was in really a lot of pain. Normally you'd use a tincture or two, a, you know, a, a, a dropper or two, um, but it doesn't have a great taste. So you might want to use brandy, a flavored brandy, in order to make that more palatable, especially if you're dealing with young children you know, they're going to let you know that it's not very tasty. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, for people who, for some reason, um, can't use alcohol, um, you can actually reduce alcohol tinctures. And what you would do is you would add a small amount of boi almost boiling water to a tincture, um, usually five mils, which is... Um, not quite five ounces, it's about four ounces is what it is. Um, and you would add that and um, add it to your tincture um, and then put your tincture in there and let it heat, give it um, four or five minutes to sit in that hot, almost boiling water and it will evaporate the alcohol and then it won't be, um, mm -hmm. a, it won't be a problem for someone who can't do an alcohol tincture. Um, so, but again, the reason we use alcohol is because it draws the material out of the plant. So what we do is, I don't know if you can follow me, what we do is we take the plant and we pull it and we would have the root on the bottom and we would take our jar and you can see the roots here that have been in there. Um, so we put the roots in the jar, and then we fill it. Now, there's been stuff taken out of here, so. But normally, wherever your dried material comes, you would put enough 80-proof vodka, usually, because vodka has no additives to it. It's tasteless, and it doesn't, um, it's the, the most, um, you know, mundane, flavor and pretty much draws out whatever the flavor is in the herbs other than if you wanted to use some flavored brandy because of the, the taste of bitterness of the herbs. But you would probably, you would fill your um, alcohol in to like two inches above your dried material and then um, just kind of move it around so that you can make sure that everything is covered. And then you would leave it in a in like out of the sun. So um, 
It doesn't have to be in an amber colored bottle. Um, glass is better because it doesn't, you know, plastic is problematic as we all have been hearing these days because of what it gives off. And um, glass is better to use. And if you put it in a closet or someplace, um, pantry, somewhere where you can sort of observe it um, for six or eight weeks, um, and every once in a while maybe just wash it around a little bit, um, and it will, that your alcohol will turn color, and in about six to eight weeks, what you can do is you can take this material and just pour it through a strainer. Um, take out all this root material and put it in your compost pile. And then um, you can re-jar this if you want because it's a smaller quantity that went than what you had when you have your roots in it. And um, cap it tightly and just and use it that way. Or you can obviously bottle it into, you know, useful sizes. Um, but you can, and because it's in alcohol, there, you run no risk of any kind of bacterial issues or mold or anything like that. And most tinctures will keep at least two years, and most of them will keep five to six years without um, altering the, or losing the medicinal effects of those tinctures. So that's really all that it takes to make a very simple medicinal tincture that you can use at home. And if, um, again, if you know what your family's common health issues are, then you can find the herbs that address those issues and, um, and have those on hand. So echinacea, for instance, is used commonly for colds. Quite often, it used to be combined with golden seal um, to kill bacteria, but um, the reason that echinacea works so well for colds is not necessarily that it breaks up congestion or anything like that. It's good because it's a blood cleaner. That's its main property. But it's often in cold remedies and other formulas because as your body is cleaning itself of those toxic substances from, you know, the viruses, it's keeping it out of your blood. So there are stories that have been told about echinacea where um, someone that was bitten by a rattlesnake was actually given one ounce of tincture every half hour until um, they stopped, their fever stopped and um, kept them from dying of um, rattlesnake poison. So that's how good a blood cleaner it is if you know how to use it. Um, but it's used in combination with lots of things for colds because um, it also is a, is a it's mild stimulant and it uses, um, it, it is good for your immune system too. It builds up your immune system. So the other way that you can use echinacea in the wintertime is if somebody has chronic respiratory issues or is prone to bronchitis or something in the winter, you can take this um, every day, one week on, two weeks off. And it will be um, a maintenance or a tonic for those folks um, throughout the winter. So this is a good um, tincture to have in your medicine closet, like over the winter cold months, for instance, for many reasons, but that's one of them. Um, how much? So normally you would take a half a dropper. Usually if you get your droppers working well, um, you can't get a full dropper of anything. You can usually only get a half. And most tinctures will say take 20 to 30 drops. So instead of like counting drops, the 30 drops is about a half a dropper fall. So, and that's really all you can usually get in one, in one swoop there. So, so anyway, um, so I, you know, instead of having everybody make a tincture, and because we could make quite a mess <laughs> at the library, I didn't want to mess things up, but. 
Um, so if we had made something, uh, we would have had a jar like that, and you would have had to wait six weeks in order to get your jar of echinacea. But um, so I just jarred you some, right? and so you can take some home if you want when you go with you. Um, so there are in this handout that I gave you, it does say for equipment to use a jelly bag or a muslin bag or a wine press to like sift out the ingredients. I just use a, um, you know, a strainer that I have in my kitchen. A lot of this stuff can be done in your kitchen. It's really very kind of appropriate to the harvest season and all the things that we do. Um, so there's liable, so when that's strained out, there's liable to be some sediment that accumulates at the bottom of your main container. Um, and it, you can strain that all out in muslin if you like, but really it doesn't, it's, there's no harm in it. It's just gonna sit on the bottom. Um, and again, there's no bacteria involved and there's no um, mold involved in any of that because of the alcohol content of the, um, the tincture itself. So um, you can make that as clean as you like. Um, so, um, this just kind of reminds you of the things that you can do when you go to make a tincture. And um, it's really that simple. Um, sometimes we make tinctures um, or herbal um, medicinals with vinegar. Um, this time of year, fire cider is quite, quite popular, which is made usually with garlic and cayenne, and it has a vinegar base to it, usually apple cider vinegar. but there's many variations on fire cider, um, but cider um, vinegar has a lot of um, amino acids and um, is, has a lot of um, electrolytes in it. So vinegar-based products, whether you use apple cider or vinegar as a base for your salad dressing or whether you make shrub, which um, has a vinegar base to it, or fire cider. Um, one of the things that traditional use of shrub was that the guys that in the summer that were out haying in the fields would be perspire so heavily that they would be in, um, you know, threat of passing out from lack of hydration and electrolytes. And so, without Gatorade back in those days, they would drink shrub. And it was the vinegar in the shrub that would actually give them their electrolytes back. Um, and so they're, you know, quite often with shrub, they will add some kind of um, fruit flavoring to it, like whatever's in season, like raspberries or that kind of thing. Um, and maybe something sweet like maple syrup so that it cuts that harsh um, sensation from drinking vinegar. But the guys in the hay fields that was what they drank, and that was the reason why. And you can also, you know, as you make your vinegars in the fall with whatever herbs you have in your garden, your rosemary or your or your thyme or those kinds of things um, to flavor your vinegar for maybe your salad dressings. It's like those those homemade salad dressings are all full of um, electrolytes that are really good for you rather than buying. Gatorade that's got way too much sugar and um, um, that kind of stuff in it. So um, that is, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to tell you about. Um, I do have some bitters here if you would like to, these are sample bottles that we've made up. Um, and you're welcome to take one of these if you want. If you want to, if you want to taste it and see if you like it first, um, you're welcome to do that too. I'll open a bottle and you can um, you can try it. Um, this is a really um, nice herbal bitter. So it's made with yellow dock, and so that's the root from the yellow or curly dock that grows um, in fields all over Vermont. And we've added ginger and turmeric, which are two really good um, garden herbs that 
are great for your immune system. Um, and with a little cinnamon in it, which is really good for insulin balance. Um, and they're done in alcohol. Um, but the flavor is um, really nice flavor. Um, if you were just, what you would do is you would take just a few drops of this, either on your tongue or in a little glass of water or um, even in maybe an, an evening toddy that of some sort with um, quite often bitters were combined with some kind of um, whiskey or bourbon or those kinds of drinks. But you can um, take them as health a health bitter also, and you don't has doesn't have to be associated with any kind of alcoholic, you know, social drink. So um, it's especially bitters are good for um, people who are older who may be not wanting to eat that much. Their their appetites slow down, and um, a few drops of bitters sometimes can stimulate their appetite to just eat better. So um, that's all I have for the evening, and unless you have any questions, so I'm happy to take them for you. Uh, your recipe for the echinacea is the same uh, recipe that I use with um, uh, black currants and vodka. Mm -hmm. Call it schnapps. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, you said put it in a dark place, shake it every once in yeah. a while. And um, I have a friend who claimed that it uh, prevented colds. <laughs> Black beer, any kind of brambles in the bramble family, there, there's, um, they have good medicinal properties. Actually, raspberries, specifically raspberries, the leaves of raspberries are really good for balancing um, women's hormones. Um, it's just it's a it's a really good tonic herb for females for you know whether it's you know premenopause or early you know menstrual cycles. Does it matter what time of year you harvest the raspberry leaves? Um, it just in the middle of the summer when they're you know really nice and the bugs haven't too nice holes in them or they haven't you know kind of gone by the. You'd probably want to get them like before the fruit is harvested. Um, the leaves are usually the best, um, and or around the time that you're harvesting fruit, the leaves are are best right in that window of time. Can I ask you about? We have a lot of Japanese knotweed. Is that oh anything boy! Is that anything anyone yeah. uses? I've heard of some people saying it's medicinal. Um, Japanese knotweed is um, become really invasive. Um, apparently, there's a species of Japanese knotweed that's really good for ticks, um, but I don't know which species it is, and I don't think it's the one that's you they're see everywhere. Up. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. So I unfortunately I don't have. <laughs> yeah. But I understand you can eat Japanese knotweed leaves. We try to, yeah, the our, ones, go, the our goats ones, yeah. like them. <laughs> the goats like them? <laughs> well, that's another thing about goats that um, I guess goats eat poison ivy and yep. it doesn't hurt them. So you could probably try sticking them on whatever invasive species you have <laughs> in your yard. Do you want to ask her about? So this tincture that we just described that you can do that with any root. You can do the same thing with any um, any leaf material. So tincturing, that's how you tincture whatever you're tincturing. And so the trick is to learn about the, the plant that you're looking at and how it's used. And then make your tincture and, and always label it as far as what it is, because I guarantee you, especially when you're drying dried material, it's like the leaves look different when you throw them in the dryer, but once they're dried and they're all broken up, you say, oh, I'll know by the smell. It's like, we've all done it, and it's like, no, you won't. <laughs> 
So make sure that you label what it is and the date that you harvested it or the date that you tinctured it so you know how old it is. And in, any information that you need to remember how to use it. Can you, well, I always wonder, so for instance, we have lemon balm. Mm -hmm. And I could use it in a tea, but I wouldn't get very much tea out of the amount. It seems like with a tincture, you, you get a higher value per um, no. Not necessarily. It depends what herb you're using. Um, lemon balm is a really nice herb. Um, it's really good for a lot of things. It's really good for um, um, stress levels and for um, um, female issues. For it's 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 really used to like bring down a lot of stress, which unfortunately in our western civilization here in the u.s we have very high levels of stress um, and so drinking a cup of um, lemon balm tea every day is a really good tonic just for stress levels or anxiety issues or any of those things um, you can tincture it um, it's nice in formula with some other women's herbs for instance um, in situations like that or for some uh, with some other herbs that might help people to sleep um, better um, so yeah either way um, lemon balm is a mint but it's a very strong one and so you can get a really nice cup of tea um, yeah and just take even just taking a few flowers i think when you draw usually when you dry material if you dry it slowly and if you want it to maintain its color um, but when you dry it it takes less dried material to make a stronger tea than it does raw material okay okay thanks so how do you maintain the color gap you, you, you just dry. you just dry it slowly and you keep your eye on it. So um, I don't recommend using your microwave ovens because um, microwave ovens you may or may not know actually um, change the um, the molecular structure of whatever food you cook in it. Mm -hmm. So I don't recommend them actually to use as cooking. So if you used it to dry your herbs, you'd be doing the same thing. You'd be taking the medicinal properties right out of them. So the best way to dry them is if you happen to have a gas stove that has a pilot light on it, that's a really good way because it's a slow drying process. Um, there are some round food dryers with um, shelves on them that you can use that have a coil in the bottom, just a coil. And that's enough heat to dry most things in like a 24 hour cycle. Um, if you do have dryers that have settings on them, you wanna dry at a really low to medium low setting. You don't wanna dry at a really, like you don't wanna, you know, some of the higher um, settings are for like drying vegetables and those kinds of things. That's a different, so the best way to get good color is to dry slowly. And things like um, mullein, for instance, that's kind of thick, um, those might take you a couple of days to dry if you're drying slowly. But small batches, especially if, you're, if it's at home, you know, you're just drying small batches and you can keep your eye on them. And again, if it's in your kitchen area somewhere where you're working like all the time, you can keep your eye on that stuff. If you dry it in a different manner and it loses its color or it turns black or something like that, is that bad or is that easily useful? Well, you're losing, um, you're losing the viability of the properties of the plant. So um, heat, too high a heat will actually take it's, the viability out. So for example, like hang dry mint and sometimes it will turn black rather than just losing it. Is that okay? Right. Um, it, can get a little darker, right. um, but if you're if it's really turning black, then you're drying it too fast or too hot. Okay. Yeah. So even like things like if you were drying um, red clover blossoms, you want them to stay red. You don't want them to turn brown. Then you know you have good quality um, 
clover. So it's better to like really keep your eye on them and dry them. And then even dried material, it's like use glass. Um, they'll keep much better in glass. Anything else? I need to clean out my cupboards. <laughs> <laughs> And then, you know, there are things like, um, you know, how to clean, um, how to use some of the vegetables in your vegetable garden too for, like garlic for instance. Garlic is hugely medicinal, um, great for colds. It's like if you like garlic, you can eat it raw and you can kill a sore throat with it. Um, that, it's that potent, it's that antiviral. Um, so, and all those things are really good to add, you know, when it comes to food or herbs for that matter, it's like when you're cooking for your families, or it, it's like throw them in your stews, throw them, you know, in your smoothie drinks, it's like throw them, you know, in your soups, it's, you get to sneak the good stuff in even though people might not like the taste of it um, while you're cooking. Because it's like good food is good medicine and you know, it's like we have the ability to really counteract a lot of health problems if we get them early enough and we get people to change their eating habits. Quite often, mm -hmm. we can really avoid um, them having to go on um, pharmaceutical drugs and either that or um, we can help the your ability to, to take pharmaceutical drugs for a shorter period of time. Um, so you just mentioned garlic for sore throats. You also mentioned uh, marshmallow and mullein as different things for different purposes. Have you ever combined them together or used sometimes. them? Sometimes. Yep, sometimes. So if you're tincturing things, it's better to tincture. There are some formulas that work really well, but generally speaking, we would tincture everything individually and then combine things after the fact so that we're not we're again even though these are simples and we're not measuring exactly we're controlling really the percentages of how we're mixing them together i have a question it might be outside the scope of what you wanted to discuss but we can you use oil as a way of drying out the medicines in a plant or is that, I mean, I guess you would maybe use that internally. Maybe that would be some. Yeah, oil is, is not that great. Um, what we, it's called a menstruum. So it's not that good a menstruum. Um, oil is good for a few things. If you're going to use that material for like making a salve or something topical, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't get it if you, you, want, you wouldn't want to take, you wouldn't want to take oil it's not that palatable. And in most cases, the oil itself isn't that, doesn't draw that well. So it's mostly a preparation. You would use that preparation if you were gonna make something with it more right. cosmetic. Right, so like, um, if you take St. John's wort and you put it in oil, it'll turn that oil an absolutely gorgeous red-yellow color. Um, so it's drawn the, the medicine out, um, but you wouldn't take that internally. You'd take a St. John's wort tincture internally, but you'd use that oil as a topical salve for skin issues, perhaps, or that kind of thing. So it's not, maybe not as medicinally, not as strong for a... It's more of a topical, I mean, St. John's wort is a good herb, but to take it internally, you'd want to take it as a tincture or in a capsule even, rather than in an oil process. Yeah. Thank so, you, Kat. Well, yeah, it was very, it was a wealth of information. Yes. Yeah. So, so don't be afraid to experiment. Just be careful and be wise and find good good sources of identification and you know um, use more than one source and use more than one way of identifying your plant.
plants. So by the leaf size of the flower, or by the smell, or by those kinds of things. So I'm going to send out makes... books on, on this kind of stuff. Oh, the to my library. <laughs> 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 So, well, thank you all for coming, and um, ta please take your tincture. Um, if you would like to take a Yellow Dock bitter, please do that too. Um, if you want to taste it first, I'll be happy to open a bottle, and you can all do the taste test. I was reading somewhere that the Yellow Dock leaves, you can cut them up and put them in your compost, and it helps. Uh, does it feed the microbes? I don't, do you know the answer? Yeah, I don't know about Yellow Dock leaves, but comfrey which grows like crazy. If you have one comfort plant, you'll have a bazillion of them. But you can, that is full of nitrogen. And you can, when you, if you cut them down before they bloom and spread, they won't spread so much, um, and then throw it in your compost, you will fix nitrogen in your compost. I wonder if the yellow dock is It might be similar, but I've never used it that way. Yeah, but there are, I mean, there are plants like that that you can use, um, you know, for, well, it's not just medicinal for us. And, you know, even for, like, some of your um, animals, so, like, for chickens and that sort of stuff, they like a lot of that, those, that green material. My horses will eat the heads off from the yellow dock sometimes, uh -huh. which is interesting. Just the heads? Just the heads. Yes, the heads. <laughs> yeah. And I also had a, a horse that, and only I only ever had one horse that I was taking care of. He would eat in the fall or late summer the goldenrod. So I was like, he has like some liver issue or something. You know? Well, that's, it's possible because when we, um, you know, I, I've had a friend whose horse we treated at one point and the, um, the herbalist that came to work with her horse, what we would, she had a number of different herbs, and what we would do is we would let the horse smell them, mm -hmm. and the horse would either refute, would would turn away from them, or he would either, or he would eat them. He would just literally take them out of her hand, and that was the way that she determined which things to combine to treat the horse for his particular problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they'll often be able to tell you that. And it might be sometimes that they just are being finicky and they don't like that particular thing. And not that it won't work for them, but um, if they're not going to eat it, it's not going to work. Right. Yeah. The yeah, animals are a little more intuitive than we are. They are. They are. It's amazing. So Jan asked about books, and we've got a lot of stuff in our inter library loan about herbal medicine, making tinctures, all kinds of stuff. So if you're interested in any of that, library hasn't closed yet and uh, it's up on the screen out there. <laughs> thank you. Great. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. yeah. Appreciate it. And there's a couple of there's um, um, business cards here if you would like to take them for later. Where do you live, Kathy? Um, I live in North Danville, Vermont, okay. but I have an office um, here in Waterbury Center, so we use the um, um, Hunger Mountain Christian Church um, site, so I ha we have an office there. They have 11 acres there, and so um, they let us use their gardens to like plant nice. stuff, so we can use them as demonstration nice. gardens, and we can... Um, we can use some of the material, plus there's a lot of stuff that we can wildcraft there. So, and I also do quite often um, video conference teaching classes in the wintertime especially. Um, so um, I do, we do have a newsletter if you would like to get added to the newsletter I, so you, that you get information about that, I'll be happy to do that. And as a matter of fact, on the 15th of this month, um, we came, we were privileged to receive um, two, three coolers full of elderberry mash from nice. um, some growers that were growing elderberries for a brewery scenario. So they did the first pressing and then they were, they gave us the rest of the mash. And so we're, we're going to like between five and whenever we're done, like five and nine on 
the, the 15th at Hunger Mountain. They have a big kitchen there. We're going to be um, stewing down that elderberry mash and for elderberry syrup. And because it was free to us, we're just going to give it to people because it's going to be way more than what we need. So if you would like to come and get some, you are you can come and see what we do and and learn and taste it and take some home with you because we're gonna have way more so than that's the 15th of this month it's the 15th of october yeah you said from, nine to it, whatever. from five to from nine. nine so it'll be in the evening oh, okay um and we'll be in the kitchen doing stuff down so um just come bring friends if you'd like because we can only take so much home with us. <laughs> um, we've used elderberries to make the schnapps too. Uh -huh. <laughs> elderberries, really high in vitamin yep. C, um, really, really antiviral. I mean, that is the best thing to treat the flu with. Mm -hmm. Don't go buy Tamiflu at the pharmacy. Go get elderberry syrup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. Amen. laughs> That's great. And it is. Um, folks that have to take boost because they're not eating or they're recovering right. from something or whatever. Yeah. Um, I've often heard them say they're too sweet. Right. There's and, a lot of sugar in boost. Yeah. And um, someone said, um, put some bitters in it. I was, would this work? Yep. If they'll, if they like it, if they'll taste it. I mean, the other thing would be find, um, go to the health food store, get rid of the boost, and find um, a um, a superfood powder. Yeah, like Cabot puts out. Not a whey product, oh. but a superfood product. So whey based is dairy based, right? Um, and that's okay, but doesn't digest well for a lot of people. A superfood powder is one that is vegetables and fruits powdered, and um, you take a scoop of it and either make it as just a water-based drink, but a smoothie would be better. And especially anything for the elderly that needs to be, um, liquid is better. So mm -hmm. a smoothie, the more you can get in a smoothie drink, and they, if you can find the flavors that they like, um, that would be the better way to get that stuff in their system. And things like um, cucumbers and celery are your sweet, what I call the sweet vegetables. So they don't have sugar in them, but they actually sweeten the flavor. So it's, it doesn't taste so um, earthy. <laughs> so earthy. Yeah. And if you get, usually if you get a superfood powder, um, um, there's the fruits in it will flavor the drink to a more kind of berry flavor too. So that would be the better way to get what they, the minerals and vitamins that they need. Yeah. yeah. Super food. Okay. Yeah, so amazing grass is a really good brand. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't taste like grass at all. <laughs> yeah. so, okay. Anyway. I will do it. So take one of each. I'm going to